Welcome to our 39th annual Juanita Brooks Lecture Series presented by the Dixie State University Library. My name is Kathleen Groder and I am so happy to have everyone here today. Um, I'm glad that everybody can join even all the way from Canada. That is super awesome. So today, Dr. Jennifer Nez Benadil is going to speak to us. She is Janae. She's also a professor in the chair of the American Studies <clears throat> at the University of New Mexico. She is the author of Reclaiming Denae History, The Legacies of Navajo Chief Manolito and Juanita, full, two books for young adults and numerous essays, articles, and book chapters. She has been recognized for her scholarship and service to her nation and community with several awards, including the Rainbow Nazalib, I probably said that wrong, I'm sorry, Three Colors for her support and advocacy on behalf of the Navajo Nation, LGBTQI, the UNM Sarah Brown Bell Award for Service to Her Community, and UNM's Presidential Award of Distinction. In 2020, she was awarded UNM's sixth annual Community Engaged Research Lectureship. She is the 2023 Benedict Distinguished Visiting Professor at Carleton College. Dr. Denadell is the chair of the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission and has served on the commission for 10 years. That is a pretty impressive resume, and we're very lucky to have her today. Um, our lecture celebrates the life of Juanita Brooks and is possible thanks to an endowment from the Obert C. Tanner Foundation. So I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Denadell for her presentation on reflections on Denae history, the photographs of Milton Snow, and livestock reduction era documents. We will follow her presentation with a Q&A session about tonight's lectures. You can feel free to add questions to the Q&A or into the chat, and I will moderate those at so at the end of the presentation. I know we'll send those over to Dr. Um, Jenna Dell for her response. I'm going to stop sharing and allow Dr. Jenna Dell to do so now. Okay, so I'm ready. Am I ready? Yep. Okay. You're good to go. Okay. I want to thank the Dixie State College and Kathleen Broder and her colleagues for inviting me to deliver the Winita, the Winita Brooks Annual Lecture. I'm very grateful and thankful for the opportunity. Um, it was originally planned that I would come to Dixie State, but the pandemic made it not possible. So, but I'm still pleased to uh, be here and I'm very pleased to share my ongoing work for you. I'm with, with you and I'm really pleased to find that uh, Winita Brooks uh, was a woman historian and I am a woman historian, I'm Diné. And uh, I'm originally from Tohatchee, which is a Navajo community about 20 miles uh, south of the border town Gallup, New Mexico. That's where um, my grandmothers are from and that's where my family continued to reside. Uh, what else? I'm also a professor and chair uh, um, at American Studies at the University of New Mexico. I am Dene. My clans are Atlogan, Shlon, Ashihi, Bashishi, Kilichini, Dashache, Tuohe, Klini, Dashinala, with AAS, and Shli. So, Kathleen, we're, we're talking like 30, 40 minutes for a lecture. Okay. So, I'm going to go ahead and screen share here. see what time it is. Okay, 6.03. So what I want to share with you this evening is my ongoing work as a historian. Um, I find I've come to, I'm coming to some kind of rec reconciliation with myself that I'm really not a book, a writer of books, but I'm a writer of essays. I always have something um, in the hopper. I'm always writing essays. Uh, book chapters and journal articles. I just completed two short essays, one for a water project um, that uh, a firm asked me to write. And then I'm working on a revision for an essay for an art exhibit at the Ammon Carter Museum. So I'm always writing and I'm always working. And one of the things that um, I love to do, love dearly is to work in archives. And so what I want to share with you this evening is um, a, one project that I'm working on, and it has to do with, it starts out with the, uh, the Milton Snow uh, photograph collection and documents, which um, the Museum of Northern Arizona in Flagstaff, Arizona owns, but also the Navajo Nation um, owns the photographs as well of Milton Snow. Uh, 
Um, so here's a photograph of Milton Stow, and I'll show you a picture of Milton Stow, and I'll tell you more about him. So I wanted to talk first about the kinds of sources that I work with, one being visual images, um, photography of indigenous people and of Navajo people. The second one, the second collection that I wanted to share with you that I'm just working with um, more recently, worked with it in several years, is the, the Solomon Kimball uh, collection, uh, manuscript collection at the Newberry Library in Chicago. And so I've been spending years, um, a month at a time, a week at a time at the Newberry Library looking over the, the Solomon Kimball papers. So in creating the net history, I have pieced together narratives that take into account archival materials and Danette oral histories about our histories. And the oral histories uh, for Navajo include creation narratives, for example, and our historical experiences. I comb archival documents searching for Diné and native voices and is often, and is often, noted, as, is often noted by native historians. This search can be onerous and trying because we often resist narratives that intend to, that intend to fold indigenous peoples into US histories as part of its multicultural multitude. As you may know, if you read native and indigenous studies, indigenous people claim distinction based upon their histories of being on the land as first peoples. They are citizens, we are citizens of our respective nations with claims to sovereignty and self-determination. So that said, I take these points as the framework for how I interpret my use of our archival documents. Foremost for me has been to privilege Diné efforts to return to our ancient teachings as they are conveyed through our ceremonies, prayers, creation stories, oral histories and our oral, uh, oral traditions and our oral histories. Oral histories include our historical experience, our stories about our experiences, and our memories of how we relate to each other. These stories tell us that we are but one among many other beings who are creations of the holy people and that we have relations with the earth, sky, the universe and all other beings and that we are accountable and responsible to all beings. So I start by investigation. This is a book manuscript that I've been working on um, for several years, um, it's it's going to feature the photo collection of Milton Snow, and probably a chapter will be on Kimball's um, papers. And so this history is about the livestock reduction era in Diné history, which is um, the 1930s and into the 1940s. Both of these collections, the Snow and the Kimball papers, offer a window into an era that was tumultuous and ultimately suggests us why we see the conditions of Navajo life in the present. It is during this period that the transition into to capitalism took, a, took on an urgency as the federal government sought to alleviate the problems they had caused with Indian Commissioner John Collier's livestock reduction policies. So I want to share, I want to start with some of the, before I start with the photographs, I just want to kind of give you a visual here of um, Navajo Nation lands, designated Navajo Nation lands. As you can see here, um, the 1868 rectangular is, is considered the original um, Navajo Treaty Reservation. And because of our population after Navajo people returned from Bosque Redondo in 1868, after being um, captives and prisoners of war of the United States from 1863 to 1868 with the signing of the treaty um, on June 1st, 1868, Navajo people were allowed to return home. And so the, the 1868 treaty, the rectangular there, has always been much too small. And in fact, when Navajo people returned in 1868, they returned to the places that they had called home prior to 1863. So you can see all of the land additions that were added with 1934 being um, the, the, the last time lands were added to um, the, the 1868 reservation. And those were added as pre, uh, US presidential executive orders. So I just want you to have, have that, that visual of um, Navajo land. Okay. Now, the livestock reduction error is a period that often that some Navajo people 
um, might uh, or do um, say is similar to their experiences of what happened to them um, at Huelte, which is our Navo, which is a Navajo word for the Bosque Redondo. Um, from 1868 to 18, into the 1880s and into the 1930s, um, a fair number of Navajo people were able to return their life, return to a life um, that, that was founded upon livestock raising. Okay, and so this is a, this is a Milton Snow photograph uh, of Navajo sheep in a Navajo home. This is um, in the uh, 1930s and 1940s. Okay, and so um, John Collier's livestock reduction policy, which was considered draconian, mandated that Navajo people reduce their livestock flocks uh, and sheep, sheep and horses and, and goats by 50%. Okay. And so that's been at the heart of the problem, part of the problem. And, and so with this, with this re-engineering that John Collier mandated, which was really um, resisted by Navajo pe people, was not understood by Navajo people, um, you had in the 1930s and 40s a whole host of people, um, they often called them well-intentioned um, federal officials, white reformers, missionaries, anthropologists, travelers who were coming. Um, onto Navajo land um, and offering, and the federal government was offering their technologies um, for improvement of a land that was de environmentally devastated, and it was it was um, attributed to having too many sheep, and so that became this issue of the transition of Navajo people from an economy based upon livestock into another kind of. of of economy, which was really an entrance into capitalistic uh, capitalistic economy, was called the Navajo problem. Okay, and so you know, according to this definition of the Navajo problem, which you'll see um, referenced oftenly, uh, you can see some of the the rationale and some of the um, the statements that guided um, federal officials and other white reformers on how to help Navajo people. And then this is anthropologists uh, Clyde Pluckhone and Dorothy Layton, 1946. They say uh, today the Navajo are facing for the first time in their completeness and full intensity these difficult questions. How are the people to live with white Americans? What alien ways must they learn if they are to survive? How much of the old pattern of life can they safely and even properly preserve? Okay, so the questions at the time into the the late 30s, 40s, 50s was um, was how to transform a, pe a people's way of life, uh, and for um, the the imposition of these principles and these um, ways of life really were part of an integration of Navajo people into um, the U.S. Uh, polity. Okay, and so that's a, that's a central question. I think that's always been at the heart of. Um, Native and Navajo histories studies as well. Okay, so some of the things that I came across in the archives um, is, you know, there's just, there's so much stuff. There's so much um, documents and reports that are related to the Navajo problem. And one of the things that I look at or I think about, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that as we get to the photographs, are um, the ways that they decide of how to save Navajo people. Okay, so you have these studies, for example, you have say, sustainability studies, which is a study of family, Navajo family groups, the distribution of Navajo populations. Okay, and so this is just an example of um, a study that I found in one of the archives. And I'll say a little bit more in terms of the archives, because when you look at archives, and take a step back and you're you're critical about the kind of information that archives hold. Uh, the work of Edward Said was very, very um, important to my understanding, my interpretation of how archives work because archives are filled with knowledge of documents and photographs and maps and, and documents of expeditions of far away and exotic places. Okay? And so these, th what's archival knowledge then, um, gets replicated over and over, and it becomes 
knowledge um, that doesn't change about a distant people. And, and so that kind of way of thinking about what's in the archives um, and, and how it gets replicated in ways that makes um, a person think they know a culture, they know a people, um, is very part, important in terms of um, what Edward Said calls the archaeology of knowledge. Okay? And so I look at what's in the archives. I look at how this knowledge and these and the kinds of reports and documents that are there, including visual materials like um, photographs, are intended to see the Diné in this case um, in terms of what's the normative for um, the U.S. and for a white um, population. Okay, and I'll explain that a little bit more as I go along in terms of uh, talking about um, interrogation um, of archives. And so the first thing that I want to do is to uh, uh, um, share with you a few photographs from Milton Snow's um, collection. Milton Snow um, took over 12,000 photographs of Navajos and Hopis um, from, he worked for a Navajo service, which was the Navajo, um, uh, the Navajo um, branch of the Soil Conservation Corps in the 1930s and 40s. And you might be, you know, more um, familiar if you hear the word like the New Deal, for example, in the Depression era. This is the, era, this is the time period that we're talking about. Um, he took, these photographs are in archives, although, um, you know, the, 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 like I said, the, the bulk of it uh, is owned by the Museum of Northern Arizona. The Navajo Nation owns um, a substantial collection. You can also find them in the National Archives. And Navajo people will recognize the photographs, but they won't know that they were, that these are Milton Snow photographs. And all kinds of editors, journals, writers, uh, people who were traveling in the Southwest and creating uh, stories um, would write to Milton Snow and ask him for um, use of his photographs to illustrate their stories and you know reports and things like that. And a lot of times you won't find these photographs attributed to Milton Snow. Um, so Milton Snow um, came to Navajo um, hired by Navajo um, by the Navajo um, service, um, his directive was to produce visual materials to document the environmental catastrophe that threatened to make Navajo land unlivable and simultaneously to educate about the benefits of introducing Navajos to superior Western technologies ranging from science-based land management programs, water development, farming, and irrigation methods to the introduction of principles of Western democracy that targeted government reform, as well as imposing notions about nuclear families as the bedrock of modern nations. Snow's photographs were used to illustrate reports and other documents to demonstrate and confirm that federal officials were addressing the Navajo problem with positive results. Further, because in the 30s and 40s and in the 50s, the Diné were primarily um, Diné language speakers and almost completely illiterate in English. So Snow was instructed to create educate, education materials through images. The Navajo problem, as federal officials saw it, was to bring the backward Navajos into the modern world. Their state, Navajo State, was one of underdevelopment commonly associated with third world countries. So through progressive technologies of the West, Navajos could be saved. Um, and here's a photograph of Milton Snow. Um, he's the one in the white t-shirt. He's um, posing with some of his Navajo assistants. Uh, they're posing against the van um, that he used to travel and to take uh, travel to take photographs. He slept on top um, in, in, at night, and the inside was a makeshift um, photograph laboratory. Okay, by all by all the accounts that I've read, um, it's said that Milton Snow was on very good uh, and friendly terms with um, Navajo people. It's um, Milton Snow had. Um, 
cerebral palsy. And so he shook very badly and he stuttered very badly. And so he really paid attention to his art, um, to, to getting a photograph. And you can just imagine how much it took for him to um, produce these photographs with um, uh, his health, uh, the way it was. Um, his writing, there's very little um, of writing that he left behind and it's in the kind of, it's, it's in a scrawl um, because of, you know, him having it, um, having to, um, uh, trouble with writing. Um, but he did leave uh, several uh, files of poetry, of, of poems that he had penned. Interestingly, in all the documents that I've looked at, um, he doesn't say very much, very, very little about um, the Navajo people with which he spent more than um, uh, 20 years with, okay? So that's kind of interesting. Now, the kind of photograph photography that uh, Milton Snow was directed to do is often called documentary uh, photography. And what he was detailed to do was to record um, the condition of Navajo land, uh, particularly the environmental devastation. This was the rationale for John Collier's um, mandates to reduce the, um, the livestock by 50%. Okay, so um, you might know it more familiarly as before and after photographs. Okay, so document, the, uh, photographs are used to illustrate, they're, they're used to confirm, they're used to provide evidence um, about um, the official position, okay? And so the official position is that um, the Navajo land is in severe um, erosion, which was of course true. Um, and that the um, interference or the imposition of federal policies and laws was very important in order to regenerate the land. Now, when I talk about the documents um, that I've been looking at um, from Saul and Kimball, one of the things that I'm interested in is the stories that I'm finding of Navajo resistance okay, to um, John Collier's um, livestock reduction mandates. Okay, So this is a, a Milton Snow photograph that shows, that demonstrates that the land is severely um, deteriorated. Okay? Um, uh, gullies were happening, topsoil was blowing away. Um, and there was also um, in this time that um, there was also the ten, a 10 year uh, drought period uh, that was happening. And I think one of the things that people have pointed to who studied this era um, have made a note of is that um, there was also fear or concern that because of the topsoil blowing away and creating these huge gulling that the, the topsoil was blowing away and it would clog the dams that were appearing up in Northern Arizona, you know, near um, uh, what is Page, Arizona now, the, the dam there, Hoover Dam. And so that was also one of the, one of the reasons that cited over, over and over for these um, mandates about livestock reduction. Okay, and here's another one. This is um, near Mount Taylor. Um, in other photographs um, of, uh, of Milton Snow's, because there was an imposition of Western technologies um, telling Navajo people that the land could be saved um, if they were to follow um, and the, uh, introduce Western technology around farming and irrigation, for example, you found um, they would uh, fence off a certain number of like 10 acres or something, and they would start applying um, Western technologies, you know, farming methods, um, seeds, um, uh, introducing a better sheet than the churro, which was the sheet that Navajo people preferred bec because its wool um, was really excellent for um, weaving. Okay, so you have this, this sense that the West can um, offer improved knowledge um, and technology to the Navajo people. And so um, Milton Snow was directed to uh, document that. The other thing, this is a Milton Snow photograph again. Um, and here 
the, the Navajo people are looking at a diorama because this is also the 30s and 40s and then into the 50s and particularly when the 70s, you begin to see this, um, these expeditions and their surveys to determine um, what natural resources were available for extraction, okay? And to also, the, the, it was important to make um, these discoveries um, palatable to the Navajo people. So here you have a, a photograph of Milton Snow, and this is at a tribal fair, probably in Winter Rock. And you see there a diorama of um, the beginnings of, a, of the establishment of a, for, a forestry uh, industry, okay, a sawmill. And so um, sometimes uh, Milton Snow's photographs were also blown up in really huge um, images uh, because Navajo people needed to understand through visual images um, because they were not you know, English speakers. Okay, and so this kind of a photograph and this kind of um, imaging or, or illustration of a diorama of what natural resources could do to, to encourage um, an acceptance of the development of these um, resources, you then had exhibits like this and fairs were places where you could get um, a large population of Navajo people as your um, captive audience. Now, um, when we're talking about um, the, the introduction of uh, programs that will improve Navajo people's, Navajo people's lives, starting with um, the land, for example, um, it didn't just, it just, it, it wasn't just um, improvements to the land with introducing farming techniques and, and seeds and um, irrigation projects and developing water um, sources. It was also a shift at a transition in Navajo community, Navajo sense of community, Navajo sense of self, particularly around, um, for example, their political system, okay, and their family unit, okay, and their sense of, um, which is a Navajo kinship. So here in this photograph by Milton Snow, you see, um, the transition of Navajo senses about leadership, um, be which began at Huelte in 1863, when the military officers and then the Indian agents um, divested the men, the, the men leaders um, of their authority and replaced it with their leadership. That kind of um, imposition of a patriarch that men were leaders continued into the 1930s and the 1940s, okay? And so here, Man, um, Milton Snow uh, has taken a picture of Navajo leaders um, in the uh, kind of in the middle here, wearing a dark um, uh, suit coat and a, and, a, a, and a white shirt is Chi Dodge, who's considered the first modern um, leader, the chairman of, of the Navajo nation, of the Navajo tribe at that time is what it was called. And these are probably first appointed and then elected council delegates, okay? So one of the things then in these photographs that you can trace or you can ask questions about in terms of um, how you read a photograph is that you also begin to see this transition um, from um, a sense about what leadership means a sense of what the relationship is between men and women, the feminine and the masculine, okay? Because Navajo people have a different sense about leadership that includes the feminine and the masculine. Um, and so um, that's one of the things also that I'm, I'm looking at in terms of this imposition of notions of Western democracy, that Western principles of Western democracy um, is heralded as, uh, a major shift in the world where there's a sense of equality and justice for all people, okay, that all people benefit from um, democracies. And yet, as our own Navajo history tells us, and what has happened to Navajo women's roles, for example, um, tells us that that um, principles of democracy have actually um, disrupted um, traditional forms of leadership, particularly um, how women are also considered to be leaders. Okay, so that's um, something that I'm also looking at in terms of reading these photographs. Another thing that, um, another area, you know, uh, Snow's 
photographs just cover such a wide area of, um, of category. So it was land, it was government, it was the political system, it was livestock, it was farming, um, but it also um, extended to education as well. Okay, so you have these people coming in there and they're trying to transform almost every single aspect of Navajo life. Um, and so this photograph here, there's, there's actually a before and after, and I'm only including this photograph um, that Milton Snow would do in terms of the before and after, where this is the photograph of a schoolboy, and he's not looking very happy um, with his breakfast, which is fried bread and coffee. Okay, This is not considered um, a nutritious breakfast by American standards. So the, the after photograph which is, a, is of a little girl who has, um, cereal, maybe oatmeal, a fruit, and a cup of milk in front of her, and she's smiling, okay? So these, um, this, these efforts to transform Navajo life just co covered almost every single aspect of Navajo life, okay? Um, here's one of the, the schoolhouses that were coming to um, Navajo land. It was John Collier who, rec who um, began the process of um, changing um, Indian policy where children had been sent off um, up at this time they would, at this time it was called reservations sent to um, distance boarding schools and so they, under John Collier there began to be day schools established in some of the Navajo communities and there was an effort or there was curriculum being created um, that acknowledged uh, cultural diversity okay and before that in the circulars of the 1880s, if you look at circulars in the, from the in, in the um, of the Indian office, there was um, strict rules about um, children not speaking their language, their native languages, um, or practicing um, have uh, doing cultural practices. Okay, so that shifts by the 1930s. Okay. Um, Navajo people love the fairs. Okay. Winter Rock is a very um, fun fair. People talk about going there. The Shiprock Fair, I think, was actually the first fair in 1938. And people think these are fun things. People like to go to the Miss Navajo pageant. Um, people like to watch the baby pageant. Um, these events at the fair were actually um, set up to bring in a large number of Navajo people for the purpose of instruction and of an education, okay? Someone else might call it indoctrination and inculcation of American values. And so women as mothers um, were also targeted by these programs, okay? You have white women um, coming in as field nurses who were instructing women about um, proper hygiene, proper mothering um, care, you know, and the opposite of that is that um, the supposition is that mother, Navajo women just weren't good mothers, didn't practice good hygiene, children didn't have good diets, for example. So they brought, they had these events at the fair and um, illustrated or demonstrated, for example, child care. You can see the, the, the mother smiling, you know, while she's washing her baby and there's onlookers. And then there's a there's a Navajo man in Western dress there narrating um, as the mother joyfully washes her child. Okay. Um, at the day schools, um, there was a, a, a sense of community there where where the um, Navajo people were encouraged to come into the to the schools, the day schools, and the boarding. There were still boarding schools, and use some of the um, things that were available there for them to use, for example, sewing, sewing machines, okay? So these seem like innocent projects, okay? Um, but they were really ways of mapping and supporting um, the program to bring Navajo people into the fold of American society. Okay? Not only would they become integrated into um, American nation as third, as citizens of the Navajo Nation, but they all of, of the um, United States, but they would also become citizens of an evolving and developing Navajo Nation. Okay. So here's the photograph that I started um, the presentation with. Um, um, a lot of these photographs 
do not have the names of Navajo people on them, thousands of them, not just Snow's um, collection, but our uh, photograph collections across decades. Uh, they don't often have the names of Navajo people and they don't name the place, okay? It kind of just collapses um, that this is what a Navajo looks like. So this one, um, Snow had actually put the names of, of people up above their heads and the caption on the back says something like Navajo people looking to Uncle Sam um, for the future. Okay, so it's, it's a statement about how um, the U.S. government has accepted its responsibility to the Navajo people, okay, to provide um, these tools of progress uh, for them. So then the work that I've done in, in Milton Snow photographs uh, is, is to think through what's not in the photographs. Right? Um, neither the photo, these photographs, um, and all, uh, they don't indicate that prior to American takeover of Navajo land and life, Navajos were considered one of the wealthiest people who lived according to their own conceptions of democracy. Um, Snow's documentation showed that wor the world that Navajos were making progress toward inclusion in a family of nations. This inclusion necessarily meant the valuing of, of nuclear family units, monogamy, heterosexuality, and patriarchy as the blo building blocks of the tribal nation. On the one hand, Snow's photographs document the rebuilding of the Navajo people into a nation and their acceptance of neoliberal values. On the other hand, they have also served uh, as signifiers of the technologies that have created Navajos um, into, the into a modern subject. Okay, so that's just some of the work that I'm doing. Um, I've really enjoyed working with these. The next thing that I want to share with you, let me check and see what time it is. Okay, um, I always I always spend too much time on the snow part, and then I'm this this next part that I'm sharing with you in terms of Solon um, Toothaker Kimball, um, his papers in the Newberry Library. I've been going there for several years and looking through them, and. Uh, Kimball was a sociologist who investigated the conditions on the Navajo Reservation during the livestock reduction era. He worked for the Soil Conservation Service on Navajo from 1936 to 1942. His papers indicate that he was contracted to determine Navajo response to the livestock reduction mandates. His papers include research notes and printed material about Navajo social and economic organization. He was in communication with the federal officials overseeing the reduction and implementing reforms. From what I've read in his papers, he was asked to investigate the resistance to livestock reduction mandates and deliver his reports to, the federal, to federal officials. He continued to submit reports to federal agencies years after his time in the field. He, inter he interviewed a significant number of Diné about their thoughts about the state of Navajo life during this era. He also reported on the resistance in the Northern region, Anath and Shiprock. Okay. And so my interest right now in the, uh, in the Kimball papers is a couple of files, several files in which um, Kimball maps or he has in their documentation of Navajo resistance. Um, we don't hear very much about Navajo resistance. If you look at um, the available studies, book late studies of the livestock era, um, you'll hear several narratives, one of them being Navajo's resistant, but at the end, they recognize the reason and the rationale and the necessity of um, livestock reduction. Okay? Um, a common refrain in the reports is that um, if you just um, appeal to Navajo reason, um, they'll agree that this was the only way um, to regenerate the land. Okay, Those Navajo people who continue to resist are met with violence. Okay? And that's never um, hardly ever talked about, I think, as fully um, as it should be. One of the things that I've recognized as a historian is that the violence um, 
aimed at indigenous people and Navajo people um, is the history that is over 500 years old. Okay? And so I'm interested in, and I haven't fully art, um, articulated it, but I'm interested in this history of resistance okay? and what that resistance looks like, um, the, the multiple practices and, and thoughts of resistance, um, which I think is very, I'm very interested in that. And so um, uh, Sim Kimball reports on the unrest at Anathan Shiprock, which is the northern region of Navajo. Um, Anathan is in southern Utah and Shiprock is um, in, the, in what is now known as the New Mexico portion. The amount of energy and resources that went into stamping out Navajo resistance was violent and intended to show Navajos the law of order, the rule of order. While we may think about the show of force at Standing Rock as an isolated display of settler violence against indigenous people. In fact, settler violence is as the anthropologist Patrick Wolf said, a structure and not an event meaning that every single time in the history of this continent, settlers use violence to contain indigenous people. Similarly, the production of intellectual materials is also intended to overlook, ignore, sanitize, and erase any memory about indigenous resistance. For knowing means we understand and appreciate what our ancestors did, that they did not go down without a struggle. We learn about our ancestors' struggles the terms of their resistance, the price of their efforts for liberation, to live in the manner of their treason, choosing. We do not have the similar struggles today. Okay, and so finally, the last thing that I wanna talk about that I will in my book manuscript is to think about how the shift that happened in the 30s and 40s in Navajo life bring us to the place um, and haunts us in the present. Okay, so because on the Navajo Nation, particularly you saw it laid bare during the two, during the the two years of COVID and ongoing, okay, um, the lack of an infrastructure, undeveloped water, um, lack of access to water, um, the state of of the economy, um, the introduction of wage work, okay, um, uh, really put Navajo people revealed their vulnerability, okay, and I and I place that in the 30s and 40s with this transition from a, a, a economy. A, of self-subsistence self and the movement into a wage economy. Okay, so I just wanna mention a couple of things. Um, Kimball's report, um, he reports two localities, one in Anath, Utah, where there was threats of violence, um, not only to government employees engaged in their proper duties, but also to any Indian who conforms to government regulations. The constant use of Indian, the term Indian in documents, refers to this fear that settlers always have about Indians, okay? And so whenever I see that word Indian, it brings up, uh, it, it brings up the image of savages, frenzied savages, um, always afraid, okay? So even though they had uh, forced the surrender of Navajo people to literal starvation in 1863, all the way to the early part of um, the 20th century, there continues to be evoked this fear of the savage. Okay? And so I think in that way, whenever they use the term Indian, that's what is being um, evoked. So um, Kimball records a beating June 17th when eight, 80 mounted Indians appeared. At, um, although no overt action occurred, the situation was sufficiently serious that if any attempts had been made to arrest or remove any Indians, for violations of the grazing regulations, violence may have resulted, okay? And so this is a report that uh, Kimball um, shares. And then at Navajo Mountain, also in Utah, a small group of, of Indians not only threatened violence, but removed by force a herd of horses that had been gathered by government employees. Threats had been made that any attempt to brand or remove horses would result in violence. At Denahotso, there was talk of arms and forces against the United States government. Although no action followed this meeting, the indictment to the use of arms may lead to serious results. It is far more probable that unless the government recognizes the seriousness of this situation and take appropriate steps, 
that there will be physical violence. Okay, so um, Kimball is detailed to um, interview Navajo people, um, discern just how violent Navajos Indians could get um, in their refusal to follow livestock policies and then also to make recommendations of what the federal government, the Indian age should do um, to stomp out that violence, okay? So the use of the word violence to name Navajo resistance, of course, veils their own violence, American violence against Navajo people. Um, and so that language is also interesting as well. So some of the, the um, the documents, E.R. Fryer um, was the Indian agent assigned, a uh, superintendent assigned to the Navajo um, reservation during this time. And his papers, E.R. Fryer's papers are over at um, Fort Lewis College in the special collections. And from reading those documents, I could see that um, he was hired specifically to show, to demonstrate to the Navajo people um, American rule of law. Okay, he was absolutely unbending in his insistence that Navajo people would follow um, American rule of law, you know, and so they use different kinds of strategies, as I see in, in, in the papers, one of them being um, taking Navajo people to court, okay, and in one document that I wrote um, some notes here on it, in one document, there's a um, court hearing for um, a couple, two couples, Navajo couples from Shiprock, they have to travel to Edith, Utah to be, um, um, to face charges in the federal court in Edith, Utah, okay? And the, the federal official who makes the report says, um, there was 80 Navajo Indians outside and armed. We, we think they were armed or they state that they're armed, but you never know if they're armed or not, <laughs> okay? Say they're armed. Um, they didn't cause any trouble, but their show of force was intended to tell us that um, the resistance is there. And then he says, I don't think there was enough of a Navajo audience um, in the court proceedings so that they would take this as a message of this is what happened, will, hap will happen to you if you resist our livestock policies. Okay, so those were just some of um, the. Um, the way in which Navajo resistance is talked about and the way in which they were dealt with. And so that's what I'm working on right now. I wanna share one last part with you and I know I'm running out of time here, but um, Kimball also has like over a hundred um, interviews with Navajo people. And I have one here um, with Manuelito who's age 16. Um, it gives a little bit of detail about him. He was he was a silversmith and he was uneducated. And one of the things that um, I think Kimball was looking for was Navajo responses to livestock reduction. And there's a very clear there's a there's a delineation with older Navajo people saying what Manuelito here says. He says down here at the bottom, sheep is all we know, and we would like to keep what we have now. We wish to be left alone with our sheep. And so in these in these um. Um, short pieces like this one, I hear a bitterness, okay, um, that Navajo people have um, about what has happened to their livestock. Um, and then you have other people like this one with Maxwell Yazi, who's age 55, he attended to the city, um, and he gets a job in Winter Rock, and he's very bitter, and he says there's a hierarchy there, and Navajo people can never hold the, the, the jobs with the benefits and the wages um, at the top of the hierarchy. Okay. Um, and so there's, a, there's a, this beginning of the transition in the, in the um, 40s that you see of Navajo people beginning to accept wage work and the, and the avenue or the way to wage work is through an American education. Okay, so I see a very clear generational difference of how people our people begin to accept education as the way as the means because our economy had to be destroyed. This is age twenty six. Um, this is a person who went to school at Albuquerque Indian School and is employed as a police clerk. Um, this one, you know, in in one. Uh, 
one large report, there was a, in June 26, 1941, there was a meeting held at Marsh Pass. There was like a hundred people from districts one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12 who were in attendance. There was like three tribal delegates from districts one and two and three who attended this meeting. And the people who attended this meeting were there to hear about um, several Navajo people going to visit President Roosevelt, you know, to, um, to please ask him to stop the livestock reduction. Okay, and so they came um, to hear about um, how that how those meetings turned out in Washington, D.C., and to make recommendations about how they should proceed um, about livestock reduction. Um, del three delegates are there, and I get a sense about the delegates being very like careful about what they say when, when their people are really angry. <laughs> You know, um, and so Gray Eyes, who was a tribal council delegate in 1937, he actually was very well known. He was a medicine person. His narrative is pretty long, his interview, and he he expresses a bitterness about how his people or his relatives are treating him. Um, he says they're re they're rejecting him, they're criticizing him. And so he says in his this is part of the narrative um, that I just pulled out for you. He says, my grandfather told me I must help others out when they are in need because I too may need help someday and whoever you have helped will be willing to help you. I found this is true. So he, you know, his daughter was sick. He had a ceremony, people came. They brought gifts of food, clothing, um, cloth goods. And he says, and now these people won't even look at me. They won't even return help. So this is very interesting in terms of how livestock reduction, the, the tension and the friction and the resistance really um, um, distorts eh relations, restores kin relationships, okay? And so I think um, in this period then, um, one of the things that I'm looking at is the shifts that have happened in, um, Navajo um, communities, Navajo nation, beginning with our relationship to the land, to the place of where livestock still continues to hold a place of reverence, to how we practice nation building, how we practice family, um, and thinking about some of the older, still in practice forms of relationship, one of them being eh, and kinship. Um, which moves beyond the heteronormative family unit. And that's what Gray Eyes is referring to um, when he's bitter and he says, you know, my, my relatives won't even look at me. They criticize me. They don't remember I helped them. Okay. And so I think part of this project is for me to rethink about these older forms of being, these older forms of relationships um, and accountability and responsibilities that move beyond human beings as the only beings that matter, okay? And particularly thinking about what it means to have these um, much lauded democratic principles imposed upon us and how they have distorted our relationships, um, not just to each other, but to the world, to the earth, um, to, to the sky. So I, I wanna end here. I have so much to share. I wanna thank you for um, listening to me. My mom and dad, were born um, during this era. My dad was born in 1930 in um, Batilid, which is Fruitland, New Mexico. My mom was born in 1934 in um, Tohachi, which is where we continue to reside as an extended family. They were raised, they were born, I, I would dare say that as some Navajo people would, would you know, immediately um, challenge me on this, but I think my parents were probably the last generation of Navajo people who were integrated into a um, livestock economy. They, were, they both were um, sheep herders for their family. They were both Navajo fluent speakers, uh, but they, they experienced life in this transition in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. They actually met in boarding school at Sturt Indian School um, and followed the mandates of the normative family unit according to American standard. My dad, my mom, they had made an agreement when they married, which they kept for 60 years. My dad would work outside of the home. My mom would take care of their, of their, of their family of five children. And they kept that um, agreement to each other for more than 60 years. So, um, and so you, 
in their lives and the stories that they've told, I see the transitions that happened from the 30s and 40s is, is a direct result to um, livestock reduction policies, the loss of sheep as livelihood, sheep, horses, goats, and the movement into the wage economy and a reliance on education as the means for um, a better life. Okay, and as many of us know, um, wage work um, in the lower echelons um, is not um, a life that allows for, for um, decent living standards. And so these are just some of the things that I work out and I working through and working out. I appreciate you listening to me. I'm trying to change my writing style from an academic um, uh, style to one that's more of a creative nonfiction. And so I start with many of the, some of the things that I start with in, in the, in, I've got two chapters um, written um, with the stories that my mom and dad told me their childhoods. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. That was a very lovely um, conversation about the main life and the livestock reduction. And I've got to say, as an archivist, I actually <laughs> love that you are looking at these images and looking for what's missing, looking for those missing stories and that bias because it's still documented there, right? That, mm -hmm. that relationship between federal government and the native people. So I think that's awesome. Um, we have a first question. It looks like we have another one coming into our Q&A session. So if anybody else wants to add some, please go ahead and do so now. Um, but our first question is, did the sheep industry rebuild within the Diné or did that knowledge about the sheep disappear? Um, you know, the, the, the numbers of sheep um, that were allowed for each family um, is not enough, is, wasn't and isn't enough for people to live on. And so it's pretty much a devastated economy. Um, the, even today, the land is, is very deteriorate, deteriorated. Um, of course, if you study like on the, if you look at the boundaries of the Navajo Nation on the Eastern, on the Eastern side of Navajo Nation, for example, um, they were, they were castigating Navajo people for having too many sheep, horses, and goats. And yet at the same time, when Navajo people were leaving these areas along the boundaries, um, white and Hispanic ranches were coming in with their sheep and, and cattle. Okay, so there's, a, there's an irony and there's a contradiction in the policies. Definitely, I could see that. Um, okay, so our next question. What snow documents, and you describe reflects the extension service approach to rural development adopted in the 1880s. It also resembles strongly what was attempted abroad under the Point Four program. How much of the federal effort was an explicit attempt to de-Indianization, de and how much of it was just blindly objective American trust in the transformative nature of technical expertise? <laughs> You're gonna have to read that to me again. Um, so it looks like he's basically looking um, on how much of it do you think is really an attempt to be in um, the Indianization, is what he says, and how much of it is just blindly objective American trust that um, technical expertise is transformative. And it, you know, these are policies that were just not directed at Navajo people. These are policies that you see worldwide that are applied to um, nations and to peoples that are considered underdeveloped, okay? So US, the US's domestic program in terms of imposition um, and of, of these notions of modernity and progress, um, were not only just tried out on Navajo people and indigenous people, but on immigrants and also um, just taken out throughout the world. It traversed uh, throughout the world as, as um, democratic principles. You know, so um, it's important to make these kinds of questions, these kinds of connections in, in a global perspective. That's actually a very good point. I like that. And um, we have another question. She says, thank you for such an informative talk with the images. And she wants to know if you've interviewed any elders in your family about their reminiscence of violence during the um, reduction. You know, as I'm working on this, which is really very slow because I've got so many 
things that I'm thinking about and I'm always writing about. And I promise, I always promise myself, I'm not going to write an, another essay. I'm going to write work on my book. I just got a, an email query. Um, and it's actually a, a book chapter on, on Milton Snow. It'll be my first one asking me if my chapter was ready. When I said I wasn't going to do any more um, <laughs> writing, I was going to, I was going to um, devote my, it to my book manuscript. Um, so uh, what was the question again? It's about um, if you've done any interviews with the elders oh, in your family. So about one the reduction. Of the, yeah, one of the things that I've, I've found, um, and I probably hope to do that this summer, and it's an important part of one, it'd be one of the chapters in this book manuscript is that I intend to go back to places um, that are featured in Snow's photographs. Um, I mentioned, for example, one of the biggest, what they call demonstration farm was in Mexican, Mexican Springs, which is just like um, 10 miles from my community of Tohatchee. They had fenced off an area and applied um, Western technologies as um, illustration to Navajo people, demonstrate to Navajo people. If you adopt these methods and these um, equipment and uh, all of this knowledge and, and technologies. This is how your farm could look too. In reality, in actuality, what happened was that these demonstration um, projects were abandoned within uh, like 10 years. Um, and so I'm tending to go back to some of these places. It's kind of like my own before and after uh, photographs as well. Um, I do have Navajo people interested in my project. Um, I haven't gotten to the point of thinking about interviews with people because I will require a um, an IRB, you know, a research. Mm. Um, uh, um, what do you call it? Um, I have to I have to submit for that. Right. So I yeah, and that takes a long time. That makes sense. Um, yeah, IRB can be a little tricky to navigate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> As can writing from academic to a creative standpoint. So yeah, give us a try. That that can be tricky. Um, we have another that says it would be very incredible to backtrack and find the photo locations. And as an archivist, I totally agree. Um, but it seems like that might be incredibly difficult to do. Um, I'm only planning for like three or four sites. <laughs> um, and I, you know, one of the things that I've had to think about a lot about in terms of land and relationship to land um, and, and the places that you get um, a sense of a relationship to the land. What's important is through ceremony and through prayer, because the, our our medicine people hold this knowledge, you know. And so, that's not something you just go and and sit for one night and take notes and then you you write it <laughs> or you you know you offer it. And this is going to take some time to do, you know. Um, I do have a wonderful relative um, who is a tra traditional knowledge keeper. Um, and I've had the opportunity to sit with them in ceremony um, and hear about, you know, the, the, um, the creation of the world, <laughs> um, the establishment of, of um, the Netra and the Nebukeya, you know, which are two different um, understandings of what Navajo land is that this is, this is take, research as a, as a Diné historian, Diné researcher, um, really takes a lot more, I think, of energy and building of relationships in order to do that work. And then the other question is, who am I doing this for? Do I really need to put it out there for the world? Um, is it just for myself and for my relatives to do this so that we continue to carry on that knowledge? That's a very important question. I agree. Um, your audience can matter and who who is it meant for? Mm -hmm. It can be a very big important question with the Native. So I have one last question. This is actually one from me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, my aunt actually went to the Navajo Nation. It had to be in the late 60s, early 70s, first as a Mormon missionary and then as a school teacher. And I remember being a kid listening to her stories and just be fascinated because they were so lovely and awesome. And I know she learned Navajo at least enough to communicate with those students. But I'm kind of curious, where was the education? Was it still about part of assimilation by the 1970s? Or had it changed so it was more, I don't know. Tell me about it. 
you know, when I mentioned that my mom and dad were, were probably the, the last generation who had been um, really part of a livestock economy, um, they were also, uh, they, I, I don't quote me on this because I'm not sure about the language fluency loss, but I've heard um, statistics um, like 80% no language fluency loss, you know, and that, that is directly related to the boarding school experience. You know, my mom and dad were fluent speakers. Um, they spoke to each other every day in Navajo. Um, and my dad, they went to boarding school. They met at their Indian school in, in Carson City, Nevada. And when my dad, when they came home and they raised, their, they got married in, in, in a, um, Orthodox Roman Catholic Church in um, Carson City, came home to raise their family. And my dad just had this policy at home that his children were to learn English, you know? And so they never expected us to speak English, to speak Navajo, even though I, I, I understand it like a fluent speaker, you know? And I'm starting to speak it um, conversationally with people. Um, but that was part of, of the policies that had they had, um, that my dad had agreed to, you know, for for his children, and it's devast it's absolutely devastating um, to have this incredible language loss, you know. And so that starts really comes in earnest in the 30s and 40s with this with the with the um, um, projects, and you know, people sanitize it by talking about it as assimilation. We're really talking about genocidal genocidal policies and the efforts mm -hmm. to exterminate us as indigenous people with distinct ways of life and ways of being. So I'm always honest about that. No, I, I think that's fair. And it kind of makes me stop and think, you know, what is maybe my family's role I have put in this? So I appreciate the honesty. Um, it looks like that is all of our questions when we're over time. So I want to thank you so much. Thank Dr. you. For your time. This was very eye-opening and a very lovely presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all of our viewers for joining us. I appreciate it.